Good morning, everybody. My name is Nicolas Rinodeau. I work for a Swedish company called Besedo, where we do a lot of online content moderation and machine learning. And I'm here today because I would like to talk to you about algebraic data types, because over the course of my career, I've had to model a lot of um, data structures, and I've come to the conclusion that you had essentially two ways of doing it. You could either do it with algebraic data types, or you could do it wrong. And, and I have done it wrong quite a bit. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to show you all the interesting ways I've done it wrong, all the creative ways I've found of messing things up, and show you why they were bad, and hopefully show you why ADTs fix all of these problems. Um, Whenever I say ADT, that's algebraic data types, just it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, and so the promise here is that by the end of the talk, you should be convinced that the properties that ADTs have are worth using. And hopefully this will um, change the way you write code significantly for the rest of your career. Now, before I dive into the proper talk, there's a bit of a backstory here, because um, a while ago I was having lunch with my wife and kids, and uh, I was complaining to my wife because I had gotten some fairly rough feedback on one of my talks. I was told that my examples were a bit too businessy, a bit boring, a bit dry, not very fun. Um, but luckily my son was here and he told me, well, dad, don't worry, for your next talk, I'll pick the example. And given that my son is five and half Japanese, Today we'll be doing Gundam. I, I don't actually know much about Gundam. Uh, I tried to look a bit into it before the talk. Uh, but I found out that um, sometimes Gundam can grow wings and then you have to call them Gundam wings, which I felt was a bit rubbish, so I stopped. So, so if at any point I, I make some grave mistake in my Gundam law, I, I do apologize. Um, it's mostly a prop for the rest of the talk. Right. So Gundams, as we all know, are remote controlled by Super Famicom controllers. And what we're going to do today is we're going to learn how to control them. And Gundams receive a very, at first at least, limited set of commands. Valid programs are, for example, face north, which is going to cause a Gundam to face, to face north. Face west is going to cause a Gundam to face west. Face south, south, and face east, east. Then you can also ask the Gundam to start, which is going to cause him to start walking in whatever direction it was facing at the time, and to stop, which is going to, to cause him to stop. And that's all the valid programs that we can send. We can, however, send any number of invalid programs, such as triple backflip, which doesn't make any sense. That's going to confuse a Gundam. And, and we all know what happens to a Gundam when he hesitates on the field of battle, even for one second, don't we? This, this is known as an undesirable outcome, and we want to avoid that. So in order to avoid that, I've done quite a bit of uh, background work. I have written the Gundam Scala API and installed that on a Gundam. And this will run any valid bytecode that you send to it. And if that results in a runtime exception or in an ambiguous situation, then the Gundam will blow up. But the important bit here is we have to send valid bytecode. So we have some sort of firewall. We have a compiler which seeing the source code might be able to say, well, this is going to yield a runtime exception, so I'm not going to compile that. So if we can make it so that commands such as, such as face of minus 35 do not compile, then we're good. We don't blow that many gun downs, which is what we're trying to achieve here. So the first step is going to be to try and model direction. Remember, we have four directions, north, south, east, and west and we want to turn that into some sort of data structure. And well, these are a set of known values. And back when I started studying computer sciences, I was told that the best way of doing that was to use magic values, open a namespace that we'll call direction, and stick some random integers in them and name them. So north is one, east is two, south is three, and west is four, for example. And that kind of works up to a point. And, and you reach that point really rather quickly. Um, in my case, it, um, it was because I was blowing up quite a bit of Gundams and I decided in order to understand what was happening, I put a black box in the Gundam and that black box would aggregate all the logs that we see at runtime so that I could actually see what was going on. And um, one of the tools that I had to write for that is a pretty printer here, the label method, which given a direction, direction being an integer, um, pattern matches on it and yields a human readable string 
for that direction. What do you think happens when I run that? Table of minus 35. Well, minus 35 is a valid integer. So that's going to be compiled and accepted, but we haven't handled that case in pattern match. So that's going to be a runtime explosion. So that's not good. Uh, we still have some loopholes, fairly obvious loopholes that can still cause the Gundam to blow up and we want to avoid that. One tool that the Scala language has, and I was told to use that instead, is type aliases. So direction is here declared to be an alias of int. And then we can rename all of our ints from before directions. Direction and int are the same type, it's just that we have a better name for it now. Then we can date label to take a direction rather than an int. And well, that's clearly a step forward because when you read that, you can see that um, the developer who reads that knows that we're not looking for any int, we're specifically looking for a direction. So as far as documentation is concerned, this is a clear step forward. But for the compiler though, since there's no difference between a direct direction and an int, that still compiles and still blows the Gundam up. So that's not good yet. Another tool that we have in Scala is enumerations. Scala has a standard enumeration type, which works kind of like that. Uh, you create four values, north, east, south, and west, which are values in the direction namespace, which extends enumeration. And of course, uh, then you have to be able to take a direction.value, which that's a bit of a step backward because direction.value is a weird type to have. Uh, I would prefer direction, but if that's what it takes to save Gundam kind, then why not? Let's, let's allow it. And now this will, of course, not compile anymore because minus 35 is not a valid direction.value. So we've, we're in a better position already, but we're still not in a great position yet because um, I don't know how you debug, but I tend to be very messy. People use that fancy debuggers and breakpoints. They just comment out a lot of code and, and print line statement over the place. And very often I will forget to uncomment some code. So for example, here, I had to comment out direction.west, forgot to uncomment it, pushed that to CI, that was deployed to the Gundam. And what do you think happens when I run that? Well, that's perfectly valid code, isn't it? Direction.west is direction.value. So that's going to be accepted by the compiler, but cause a runtime explosion because it's not handled by a pattern match. And that's typically known as a pattern match exhaustivity checking issue. The compiler should be able to know, well, I know all the possible values for that type, and I know that this code doesn't handle at least this one, so I'm not, I'm not going to compile. And Scala enumerations disable that behavior. So they're a bit rubbish. We're going to use something else instead. We're going to do what all engineers do um, when the standard implementation doesn't quite do what they want. We're going to reinvent the will. We're going to write our own handwritten enumeration. Direction, which is an abstract type, and in a direction M space, four values of that direction, north, east, south, and west. And that is pretty much what we wanted, but of course, label, well, it now takes direction, so that's good. But the compiler still does not know all the values of type direction, does it? Because it knows all the values in that compilation unit, but we're in a JVM world. So we might have other implementation of direction in the class path somewhere or coming from outside or deserialized from somewhere. And the compiler cannot know all the possible values. And the Scala compiler has this weird quirks that when it does not know all values, it doesn't even bother to do any checking whatsoever. So this is still going to cause a runtime explosion. Luckily, we can give the compiler all the information it needs. If we mark our abstract type direction as sealed, that's telling the compiler, there is not going to be any other subtype of direction. There is not going to be any other value of type direction than the ones declared here. And once you have that, the compiler knows all the values and he's going to realize that when you run that, it can't compile because you haven't handled the West case, which is really pretty great because now we are forced to handle every single case that our code needs. We can't have loopholes that allow the Gundam to blow up. So what have we learned so far? We've learned that um, enumerations make nonsensical values impossible to represent, and they guarantee that our code handles all necessary cases. But that is provided you're not using Scala enumeration because that's really bad. Um, but these things are good properties to have, but we're going to see that we can have more, more interesting properties. Now that we have um, designed the direction, we need to represent command. And if you remember, commands were face of direction, start, 
and stop. And a naive way of representing that, uh, that you still find a lot in Scala code, prominently from people who just started Scala after years of Java, is an implementation like this one, the record command, which takes an order as a string and an optional direction. And the direction's gotta be optional because only face takes direction, start and stop don't. And this representation, of course, um, will allow this kind of command, triple backflip, which we know is not going to be fun. So we don't want to allow that, but well, we know the tool for that problem, don't we? We, we have three commands, phase, start, and stop. So it's an enumeration that we want to use for that, isn't it? So let's do that. Let's turn order into an enumeration. Order with three values, phase, start, and stop. And well, that makes command use order rather than the string. And now, this does not compile because the string triple, triple backflip is not a valid order. That command, however, start south is a valid command. And well, is accepted at least, but that doesn't make any sense. Start south is not a valid command at all. So that's going to cause a runtime explosion, which we want to avoid. Now we have this problem because our current model allows us to declare a phase without a direction or a start and stop with a direction, which we want to avoid. But if only phase can take a direction, why don't we move direction as a parameter to phase? Something like that, update phase to take a direction parameter. And just like that, start cannot st take a direction, stop cannot take a direction, and phase must take a direction. This is exactly what we wanted. It is in fact so much what we wanted that this is not the order type anymore, this is actually command. It's exactly what we wanted to do. And now this obviously doesn't compile anymore, but command.start does. And what have we learned? Well, we have learned that enumerations are everywhere. The first problem we encountered in that modelization, we had to reach for enumerations. They're not quite enough though, we had to tweak them slightly, but something very much like an enumeration might be enough. And this is what we're going to explore by trying to compose commands together. See, at the moment we can do that, send a start command, which is not bad. But what we really want to do is we want to be able to send batches of commands. We want to send this set of commands, the gun down to accept it and execute them one step at a time. And just because it makes sense, we want the composition of two commands to be another command. Um, and of course, that means that we know at least half of the answer to the problem. Since we want the composition of two commands to be a command, then we have to change the command type, don't we? Command has a new branch now we can have a chain command, which is a composition of a first command and a second command. And when executed, it's going to execute the first one followed by the second one. And just like that, it looks like we have solved our problem um, until we have to write such a chain command. This is what it looks like, which is not nice. If you squint, you can see that this is saying face east, start, stop, face west, start, stop. But I mean, it's not pleasant to read and I had to write that, it was even worse to write. So I don't ever want to have to do that again. So we're going to indulge in a Scala tradition. We are going to write a DSL for that. The mechanism of the DSL are not very interesting, but this is what this does. Given a command CMD1, we can squiggly arrow it into a command CMD2 and that's going to yield the composition of the two commands. And it's good practice when you write a DSL to give um, terse aliases for the various elements of your vocabulary. So here are our commands, start, stop, and face, and our direction, north, east, south, and west. Now this allows us to create this new command, move, which given a direction, will face that direction, start, and stop. And this command here will compile, which is pretty neat because that is a wall of text that we had before. We can now express it like that. And this is going to close again down to evaluate the whole thing and come back which is exactly what we wanted to achieve, isn't it? So at this point, we have completed our data structure. We have used case classes, chain and phase, so those are records, and um, they are known as product types. Enumerated types, command and direction, for example, which are known as sum types. And we had to make command recursive. It's expressed in terms of itself because chain is a command that contains a command. And this is all we need to know to start talking about algebraic data types, ADTs properly, and to define them in a more, slightly more formal way. So algebraic data types can be some types, 
where a sum type is a discriminated union of values and can be thought of as an or between types. Here, command, for example, is an or between phase, start, stop, and chain. You have product types, which are aggregation of values, and you can, you can think of them as an end on types. Chain is a command and a command. And finally, an ADT is a potentially recursive sum type of product types. Command is a sum type, because we have all these fours, of product types, and it's recursive because command is expressed in terms of command. And this is what an algebraic data type is. And it offers us some fairly nice properties. We have seen um, impossible to represent illegal states. Um, we are forced to handle all the necessary cases. Those are good properties, but we can get more. And I'm going to show you how to get even more through, well, here is a point where I must admit that I have kind of lied to you for a bit. I have been composing comments left and right, but you can't actually compose all commands together. If you have this command, for example, start and then start, well, that's going to code again down to start, but then when you ask him to start again, he's going to be confused. He's already started. What do we want him to do? That's what happens. Same goes for stop. He's already stopped. And we ask him to stop again, runtime explosion. And even worse, if we get the gun down moving and then ask him to change direction, that's going to end up in a mess of tangled leg. And this is really not something we want to do. So how, how do we make sure that this state transitions from start to phase or from start to start are caught at compile time? Well, again, the answer is almost entirely in the question. We need it to be the type level because we want the compiler to, um, to find these problems. And, um, and the problem is of one of state transition. So we have to keep track of state. So we need some sort of type to keep track of state. And there they are, idle, which represents a Gundam that's not moving, and moving, which conveniently represents a Gundam that's moving. And if you pay attention, both of these classes are both final and abstract, which means you can't possibly have a value of type moving. It's just a type which allows us to rewrite command to now take a couple of type parameters before and after, where before is the state the Gundam must be in before you run the command, and after is the state the Gundam will be in after you run the command. And now we can update all of our commands. Phase, for example. Well, phase, you have to be stopped before you can turn around, because we've seen what happens when we're not. And you don't actually move, you just turn, but you don't start moving. So it's a command from idle to idle. Start, you must be idle and you go into moving. And stop, you must be moving, and then you go into idle. And now we have chain, which is slightly more complicated, but not that much. You need a command one from A to B, and you can compose it with a command from B to C. And see, the trick is here. These commands must commute. It's the same B on both ends. So the first command must end in a state that's compatible with the second command, which is how everything works. Of course, that yields the command of A to C, and in order to be able to use that with our DSL, we need to update it slightly to put types all over the place. Uh, it's the same logic, so you can take a command from A to B, squiggly arrow it into a command from B to C, and that's going to yield a command from A to C. So that's nice, um, but I don't know if you remember, when we were talking about enumerations a while ago, we saw that it had a profound impact on the way pattern matching behaved. It allowed the compiler to detect whenever you failed to handle a necessary case. Well, we have the same kind of properties here. I kind of skipped a bit, sorry. Um, before what I just said, uh, we have made these transitions impossible because start and start will not compile because we go from a moving to a state of, from an idle to a moving and then start requires to start from idle. So that doesn't compile. Same goes for stop, can't compile anymore. And start followed by phase, doesn't compile anymore. But of course, our previous command, move, phase, start, stop, compiles, and a Gundam is going to execute everything. Now, back to this whole pattern match thing. This is essentially the same method as our label from before, except now we're printing the label of a command which starts from moving. And we have two cases to handle. We have a stop case, because stop goes from uh, moving to idle, and we have chain, because it's possible to have for example, the chain of um, stop followed by face is going to go from moving to idle to moving. So it can start, start in moving. So we have to handle that. What do you think happens when I try to run that? It is a valid command, start, but it's not a command 
from moving to anything because it's a command from idle and the compiler is going to reject it, which is quite nice. But I went into another debugging session, commented that chain, and here the compiler is going to realize that I have forgotten to deal with the chain case and require that I deal with the case. So we still have this nice property of we have to do all the work. But then if when I incommented chain, for example, I realized that I had forgotten to handle the start case and I add it, then the compiler is going to tell me, well, start is not actually possible in this position. Don't do the work, it's not needed. The compiler is going to make sure we do all the work, but only the work that we have to do. No, it's going to identify the work that we don't have to do, which, which is the best kind of work, isn't it? So we, have, we also have another property. It's a bit of a weird one, I'm not sure how useful it is, but I do find it very cool. If you look at that pattern match here, what's T? It's a type variable, right? It's a variable that holds a type. And not only do we have a type variable, I didn't know you could do that in Scala. The compiler actually knows what type goes in that variable. I found it really very cool. I've never had to use it, never found a use case for it, but I have been told that people who write statically typed, purely functional programming language compilers find that very useful don't actually do that for a living. So I don't know if it's actually that useful, but I do find it's very exciting. Uh, what have we learned? Well, we've learned that if we use type constraint on our sum types members, we can make legal state transitions impossible to represent. So illegal states and illegal state transitions. We can guarantee that our code handles all necessary state transitions, but only the necessary state transitions, which is quite a nice property to have. And we also um, can now brag that we've been doing not only algebraic data types, but generalized algebraic data types, GADTs. Of course, we're not going to do that just yet because we haven't um, had a proper definition for the term, but that is what we have been doing so far. So um, definition, generalized algebraic data types. I tried to find a definition for that online and I found hundreds of links and every single one read something like, we all know what a generalized algebraic data type is. Now that we know what it is, this is how you implement them in Haskell or in OCaml or in Scala. And apparently everybody's supposed to know what that is. And, and I kind of felt left out because I didn't. But since everybody knows, I asked on Twitter because I felt at the time it was a good idea. And this is the kind of answer that I got. Um, this one is from Christophe, um, fairly famous in the French community for knowing a lot about types. And he has this to say. Yes, you're right. List is indeed an ADT. It is defined by being the list fixed point of the type equation. List is equal to lambda of A, which is a type, applied to mu of B, which is a type, applied to one plus A times B, where mu is a list fixed point operator. I initially thought it was a joke that he trained some sort of generated model to spout random type crap at me, but um, we actually talked about it and he explained it. And it's actually completely correct, extremely useful if you have a large, type um, type theory background, which I don't at all. So very good definition for people who can understand it, I couldn't, couldn't use that. Luckily, Rob Norris uh, came to the rescue and he had this to say. Scalar types form subtyping the T's and terms have monomorphic types. List is a covariant GADT where Neil has type list at bottom. So Neil conforms with list of A for all A by subtyping, not by for quantification. So we use GADTs to encode the empty case. I understood a few of these words and I actually think, I kind of see where, where um, Rob Norris is going with that, but it's not terribly useful to me specifically because I don't understand half of what he's saying, not because it's wrong, just because I don't have the background to understand it. Then we had Raul Haja uh, of Kotlin fame, who's, who's well known for knowing a lot about a lot of things and maybe sometimes being a bit cryptic when trying to explain them. Um, and he had this to say, most relevant ADTs are GADTs or free versions of them. Option of A, either, etc., are GADTs. The IO's run loop are interpreter of uh, embedded free monad where IO keeps computation verified for the interpretation. You can model anything with GADTs as you can do with straight. Now, knowing Raoul, I'm fairly sure that if I had a chance of talking about it with him and he didn't take so many shortcuts, it would make complete sense, but I have no idea what that's on. I, I don't understand it at all. Um, and then we have a uh, Ruben who had this to say, that's no monad, it's a moon, which I'm assuming it's a Star Wars quote. 
but it doesn't make any less sense than the other definition I got. So I don't know, and I don't dare find out. So at this point, I kind of gave up on Twitter because it wasn't as useful as I hoped. And um, luckily, I'm a member of a different set of communities, uh, various communities online, and on at least one of them, there was somebody who knew a lot about types and had a lot of patience and decided I would learn what the JBD is if it killed him. It very nearly did. But now we have a good definition. Before I give that definition though, um, I always try to um, cite my sources. So now I must stand in front of you all and tell you that I have learned what a JBT was from somebody called XHTML boy, which doesn't sound like the name of a reputable source of information about advanced type theory. But I think that's the whole point. I think he took that nickname because he wanted somebody to do what I'm just doing. Um, so it's a bit humiliating, but at least I got a very good definition out of it. And I'm going to share that with you. A GABT is a sum type with one or more witness types, each equipped with a type equality. It's a three part definition. We already know the first part. We know what a sum type is, don't we? We've been spending the past half hour also talking about that. What about a witness type? A witness type describes properties of a sum type's branches at the type level. So if you take command, the for is a type, so it's at the type level, that describes a very important property of all of the branches of the command subtype, subtype. It describes the state the gun must be in before it can run the command. So we have a witness type right there. And after is also a witness type. It's not the state, it will be before, but after. So we have two witness types. You can have more than one. You don't have to, but you can. And finally, type equality. Type equality is information available to the compiler about each witness type, allowing it to refine pattern matches. Concretely, if you take moving label, um, the, the compiler knows that here we have a moving type. So when it spots chain, it knows that there is at least one value of type command, command from stop to start, I think, uh, whose type parameter is equal to moving. So knowing that I have found a chain whose type parameter was equal to moving and chain is not handled, I can fail to compile because there's a loophole. Similarly, it knows that start has a first parameter of idle. Idle is not equal to moving. So I don't actually need to handle that case because it's not possible in that position. So that's not all that complicated, really. We have to have a sum type. It's got to have type parameters which describe properties of the branches. And each of these branch has some type that is moved to the compiler so that it can refine pattern matches and make them smarter. And that is, in a sense, what a JDT is. So why was it so hard for the Scala community to actually give me an answer? Well, take a look at this sum type in Scala. Option to sum type with two branches, sum and none. And it represents um, the potentiality of a value. So if you have a sum, you have a value. And if you have a none, you don't have a value. If you look at it that way, though, what are sum and none? Well, there are types. You can create a value of type sum of A. So there are types. And they encode very important properties of each of the branches of option, don't they? Some is a non-empty option and none is the empty option. Those are pretty much witness types according to the definition we just saw. Do, do you see where I'm headed with this? If you take a look at that save get method. Save get take a non-empty option and returns whatever was inside of it. And the compiler, knowing that if we take a non-empty option, a sum, knows that sum is equal to sum, so we, we have to handle that case, but sum is not equal to none, so we don't have to handle that case. And that is exactly type equality. So in Scala, you can't declare a sum type that doesn't have witness types and type equality, which is why it's so very hard for us to understand what a JDT is, because you can't not declare one, so you can't really see the difference between a regular JDT, a regular sum type, and a JDT, because in Scala, they happen to be exactly the same thing. Um, in conclusion, what we've learned here is that we're in the Scala community all a bit strange about JDTs, but they have an actual easy to understand definition. It's just that Scala is really bad at helping us see it. But if Scala is so bad at it, how about some Haskell? Because Haskell makes it a lot more obvious. In Haskell, this is how you declare option. Option of A, this is a sum of A or a none. But critically, sum and none here are not types. They're just functions that given an A returns an option of A or a none. So not a none, an option of A, that's the point. Those are not types. So that means you can't write save get because you don't have a type to mean non-empty option. That does not exist. So we have to create one. And how do we do that? 
we create that, we, we add that property by manually adding a new um, type parameter, phantom, which can be either empty or non-empty. And then we write some smart data constructors that given an A, we'll return an option of non-empty, which is always a sum, and given a non, well, and for non, just returns a non. And when we export all of our modules public interface, we conveniently forget to export the regular constructors and we only export the smart ones. Which means that by construction, we know that outside of our module, it is not possible to have an option of non-empty, which is not a sum, and an option of empty, which is not a none. This allows us to write safe get, because now we know we want an option of non-empty, and we deal with the sum case easily, because, well, that's just unwrapping the value. But we still have to deal with a none case, because even though we have made it impossible to have a none of type option of non-empty by construction, we haven't proved that it was impossible. The compiler does not know that. It's lacking, clearly, type equality, which in Haskell, you add by using JDTs. Option is now still, uh, still has a type parameter phantom, but now sum is explicitly a function from A to option of non empty, and none is explicitly a function to option of empty. And at this point, the compiler knows that if you have a sum, then it must be an option of non empty. And if you have a none, it must be an option of empty which allows us to rewrite fake get. And the compiler will know that non is an option of empty, which cannot be equal to an option of non-empty, and it's completely fine with us not handling that case. We get another fun property. The whole code here is not interesting, but if you look at OPT, it's of type option of phantom of A. Phantom, not a specific value, just phantom. But yet, in the sum branch, we call save get of OPT. And if you recall the type signature of save get, was option of non-empty, not option of any value, option of non-empty. That's not the type of OPT, is it? Turns out that the Haskell compiler knows that in a sum branch, OPT has, must have type option of non-empty. And so in that branch, locally, in that branch only, it changes the type of OPT, which allows safe get to compile, which I find really very cool. But again, probably only useful for people who write uh, compilers for statically typed functional programming languages. But I still find it really very cool. What have we learned here? Well, we have learned that Haskell makes JGs very clear. You need some types, but that's not good enough because then you can't have properties about the types. So you need witness types. And the witness types are almost good enough, but you need type equality in order to be able to refine pattern matches for the compiler. And in closing, if you only remember one slide of this entire talk, ADTs and JDTs make illegal values impossible to represent. They also allow the compiler to make sure that we're dealing with all necessary cases, but only necessary cases, which are, in my opinion, very important properties for a data structure to have, because it means you can't possibly have these dodgy states that you know you, might, you want to handle, but they're not possible, but you're not sure because you don't have a proof that they're not possible, so you kind of have to write the code. But it's just, you, when you have a value, you know it's legal. You don't have to double check it. It's just it's a good value by construction. And it also makes sure that you don't forget to deal with the cases, so you don't have loopholes, and you don't write code that's completely useless, but you're not sure, so you still have to write it. So given all of these properties, I feel it is completely irresponsible to not use ADTs when possible, because then you lose so much safety in your program. And it also makes your program far more terser, because you have a lot less tests. And do we have any questions? Because um, if you're not sure what to ask, I have a couple of suggestions. We've got a couple of questions in Q&A a bit, but you've got time for your bonus material as well. So feel free to head away with both, Want to go oh. both. Okay, I'm not sure I have time for both. Um, I'm going to do the discriminated part because that's important. I um, thing is when, when I gave the definition of some type, I said some types were, un, uh, were discriminated union types. And nobody stopped me. Everybody said, well, yeah, of course, discriminated unions. That's, everybody knows that. But I didn't. So I think it's worth um, explaining why I mean that, what I mean by discriminated union types. And in order to do that, I need to talk about what union types are. And initially, we had non-discriminated unions. In C and C++, you could write the union of int or string, which was composed of an int value or a string value. But you had no way 
of differentiating between the two at runtime. So you could not write print union, which given a union would print a correct one. At compile time, you just had not, no way of knowing that, which was a bit of a pain. So people came up with the idea of using explicitly discriminated unions, which works like that's kind of quite a bit more code, but you first need an enumeration, which declares two tags, int and string, and then a larger structure, which is composed of a tag, which is telling us what our union contains and a union, as we've seen before. And if you manage to keep them, to keep both in sync, then you can write print union, where if the tag is int tag, then you know you have an int value. And if it's not, then you know you have a string value. So that's um, what we wanted to achieve, but it's a lot of work and it's work that's really easy to get wrong. And you have to do it every single time you want to make a union. So that was a bit painful and, and people decided, well, this is very mechanical work, isn't it? So I would like for the compiler to do all that work for me, which is how we get discriminated unions, or sometimes. In Haskell, for example, this is a discriminated union, int or string, which is either an int tagged with i or a string tagged with s. And then print union is just a case of pattern matching. And if we have an i, then we can print the int and an s would print a string. So there's no possible ambiguity here. You can do the same thing in Scala with a bit more code, uh, but hopefully that's getting better soon. Int or string. Um, is either an i of int or an s of string, which allows us to print print union with a pattern match, again, like before. Those are discriminated union types. And then we have the dirty style unions, which are just a bit weird, because while well, they look discriminated, don't they? Here, if I print union of int or string, then if it's an int, then I print int, and if it's a string, I print a string, which sounds like it's discriminated, but then if instead I have an int or int, um, the compiler doesn't know how to make the difference between the first and the second one, and it's going to fail to compile. That gets even worse if you start using um, parametric polymorphism because type information is lost at runtime and the compiler can't make a difference between a list of string and a list of int, for example. So it's not entirely clear what dirty style unions are. They're a bit weird, but I'm sure they're going to be very useful. And we've learned that discriminated means that you can have, you can differentiate between values at runtime. And there are multiple ways of encoding this and Scala 2 at least uses runtime information, runtime type information to make the discrimination, I believe. So that was the bit about discriminated union types. Do you want me to stop and go into questions or do you want me to try to do the bit on um, the algebra of types? We've still got um, just over 20 minutes left. So whatever you feel that you've got time for, really. Yeah, that would be time enough, I think. Mm -hmm. So the algebra of types. Because um, so, we've been calling types algebraic data types for a long time now. What's so algebraic about them? Why algebraic? And, and that's what we're going to explore now. But first, I need to introduce a notion. It's a notion of cardinality. The cardinality of a type A is a number of values of that type. So for example, in Scala, we have nothing, which has zero inhabitants. It's just a type, can't have values. That obviously has a cardinality of zero. Have unit, which is just a single value. So that must have a cardinality of one. And finally, we have Boolean, which is either true or false. So that's a cardinality of two. And if you try to explore um, the cardinality of some types, such as either of AB, for example, well, the inhabitants are left of A and right of B. But then we must know the cardinality of left of A and right of B. Left of A contains a left of A for any A. So it's got exactly as many values as A has. So it's got a cardinality of A. Same goes for right, it's got a cardinality of B, which means that either of AB is all the values of left of A plus all the values of right of B. It's got a cardinality of A plus B. And that plus sign, is no coincidence, some types are called plus because you add up the, the um, cardinalities. Now, I have to introduce the notion of type equivalence. I'm going to say that two types, A and B, are equivalent if they have the same cardinality. Um, I used to call that two types being isomorphic to one another, but I've been told that this was not actually quite correct. I'm not entirely sure why, I still haven't understood, but since some people object to it, I'm calling that type equivalence in this talk. And now that we have this notion of equivalence, um, let's do some algebra. 
In algebra, you can write one plus one is equal to two. And this actually translates very well to some types because either of unit to unit is equivalent to Boolean because either of unit unit is cognitive of unit plus cognitive of unit, so one plus one, which is equal to the cognitive of Boolean, which is two. But one way of uh, convincing yourself that this is true is just to list all possible combination, match them. So if you match left of unit to false and right of unit to true, then you get community of two. And you can see that Boolean and either unit unit are essentially the same type with different names. Similarly, in algebra, you have some associated, you know, that a plus b plus c is equal to a plus b plus c. That also works for some types. Either of, either of a, either of b, c is equivalent to either of either of a, b, c. Because both of them have the community of a plus b plus c. And you can, again, do the mapping to convince yourself. Left of a maps to left of left of a, etc. Some type, sums are commutative, a plus b is equal to b plus a, which happens to carry over to some types. Either of a, b is equivalent to either of b, a, clearly. You can do the mapping again if you want to convince yourself, but it's both case a plus b. And we have a neutral element in uh, algebra for the sum, a plus c is always equal to a, and um, that carries over to some types because either of a nothing is equivalent to a. Here's the mapping if you want to convince yourself. So we have quite an obvious connection between some types and sums. We do have the same for product types, because if you look at that, the product type of A and B has exactly as many elements as all of the A's combined with all of the B's, and that's a multiplication. The product, the community of the product type AB is the community of A times the community of B, which is why we call them product types. And we have the same kind of properties as with some types. A plus A is equal to two times A. We can factorize types. So this allows us to say that either of A, A is equivalent to the product type of Boolean and A. Here's the mapping, if you want to convince yourself later. We also have associativity. A times B times C is equal to A times B times C. Works for types. Here's the mapping. And we have commutativity. A times B is equal to B times A because product of A and B and product of B and A both have a community of A times B. And here's the mapping again. And finally, uh, we have a neutral element for um, products, which is one. A times one is always equal to one. Similarly, the product type of A and unit has a, is equivalent to A. And here's the mapping. So we've worked with some types and product types here, uh, but if you remember the definition of an algebraic data type, we said that it was a, sum, a potentially recursive some type of product types. We've seen some types, we've seen product types, but, but recursive types. Well, here is a pretty uh, standard recursive type list, which is either a, a nil, which is the empty list, cognitivity of one, because there's only one empty list, and cons, which is composed of a head, which is an A, and a tail, which is the remaining element. And that has a cognitivity of a times list of A. If you look at the communities, nil, this is just one value, nil. So community of A. A cons nil is so going to be the product of A and nil, so A times one, so A. A cons A cons nil, so it's going to be A times A times nil, A squared, etc., etc. For any list of A of size N, we know the community is A to the N. That's starting to look like something that we've seen in algebra. Um, I vaguely remember at least. Uh, that tells us that we can compute the cognitivity of all the possible list of size at most n, which is this formula, the sum of the cognitivities of a to the power of i. And we know that there's a formula to simplify that. And well, this works in algebra, but it's weird though. We have division types now because we have a division here. I'm not exactly sure uh, how, how, how that would work, but the equation does carry over. Because if you want to try it out, a list of Boolean of size two, maximum two, is going to be either a nil or Boolean const nil or Boolean const Boolean const nil. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven elements. But you can also apply the, the, the equation. Boolean has a community of two. So that's two times two plus one two times three, that's uh, two, um, to the, to the, two cubed, that's eight, minus one, seven, divided by 
one, seven. And that works for all cardinalities. So if you have a list of Boolean Q of size three, then you get 15, which you're gonna write at the, um, at the table to look at all possible composition, but you can also simply apply the formula. Um, two to the power of three plus one, two to the four, 16 minus one, 15 divided by one, 15. So that works and that actually carries over. That's both really powerful and kind of weird because we're using divisions now to compute type communities. I find that a bit surprising, but really very fun. So what have we learned? We've learned that ADTs have a deep connection to the algebra you know. Um, you can use this connection to prove fun facts about types, and you can clearly also use it to pad a look, to pad a talk and look clever. 